Good afternoon everyone. Avacta Animal Health has been supporting veterinary practices with the workup and management of allergic disease in dogs, cats and horses since 1999. Their allergy testing services under the Centre Test brand provide a range of options to meet the needs of veterinary professionals and the complexities they face when managing allergic disease. This includes tests to rule out both ectoparasites, bacterial yeast and fungal infections, tests to identify sensitivities to secondary infection, food panels to aid in the rule out of adverse food reactions, environmental panels to help identify causal allergens for allergen avoidance and inclusion in immunotherapy, allergen specific immunotherapy. This year sees the fifth year of Avacta's Pet Allergy Awareness Poor campaign, which aims to work with vets and nurses to engage and educate owners on their animals' allergies. For more information, go to www.avactaanimalhealth.com forward slash poor. I would now like to hand over to RCVS Advanced Practitioner in Veterinary Dermatology, Catherine Cuddy. Thank you very much, Sammy Jo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you all for joining me and taking the time out of your busy day. This webinar is designed for vets who are in general practice and who are either not using allergen immunotherapy or maybe have limited experience with using it. Allergies are on the rise, both in ourselves and in our pets, and atopic dermatitis is a frequent presentation in general practice. Skin disease is one of the most common reasons for owners to bring their pet to the vet, unsurprisingly, as it's right there in front of them. It's also, unfortunately, one of the most common reasons for clients to change vets. An atopic dog who is properly managed should act, look and feel the same as a non-atopic dog. These are my dogs and my parents' dogs, and one of these dogs is severely atopic. And just looking at these four, you have a better chance of guessing correctly which dog has had their spleen out versus which dog is atopic. And this is the other end of the spectrum. And this is Cherry. She is a five-year-old Sharpe with uncontrolled atopic dermatitis. And this is what we don't want to see, because in addition to formulating a treatment plan to control the primary atopic dermatitis, we also have to address the severe secondary changes that she has. You can see the severe alopecia, hyperpigmentation and lichenification of her skin, which is sharply demarcated from the haired skin. The second picture is Sherry after six weeks of treatment, and she has shown a dramatic improvement. Her initial treatment plan involved an ectoparasite treatment trial, topical treatment for severe secondary malassezia infection and cyclosporin to reverse the secondary changes and control her underlying allergy. So this afternoon, we're going to do a quick refresher on diagnosing atopic dermatitis, and then we will discuss using allergen immunotherapy in practice. Because if you want to use allergen immunotherapy, it's critical that you have correctly diagnosed atopic dermatitis. If you have missed another pruritic skin condition, like ectoparasites or a secondary bacterial or yeast infection, or a different hypersensitivity, such as an adverse food reaction, then your immunotherapy is not going to be successful. So what is atopic dermatitis? We look at the official definition first, and then we'll go into more detail. So atopic dermatitis is a genetically predisposed inflammatory and pruritic skin disease with characteristic clinical features that is associated with IgE antibodies, most commonly directed against environmental allergens. It's also important to highlight atopic-like dermatitis. This is also an inflammatory and pruritic skin disease with clinical features identical to those seen in canine atopic dermatitis, but the IgE response cannot be documented. ICADA are the International Committee on Allergic Diseases of Animals, and on their website are papers that are free to access. I will be mentioning a few of these papers as we go, and this is where you can access them if you would like to. So successful treatment of any disease is depending on us having the correct diagnosis to begin with, and atopic dermatitis can be a difficult diagnosis to make. There is no test that can tell you if your patient is atopic or not. You are relying on their signalment, their history and their clinical signs. The quickest length of time that I would expect to be able to make a definitive diagnosis of atopic dermatitis is eight weeks. And it's usually longer than that. It's usually between 12 and 16 weeks to make the diagnosis. 
And the problem with this disease is that it can present differently and each presentation in turn probably resembles many other skin conditions. All of these dogs are atopic, yet they all look very different. The French Bulldog on the top left has a secondary Staphylococcal pyoderma and the Sharpe has a secondary yeast pyoderma. The Bulldog is a much earlier presentation, displaying muzzle and chin erythema and erythema of his axillae and his interdigital spaces. This is some recommended reading. This paper is available on ICADA.org and I would strongly recommend that you print it out and read it. It will help you to diagnose atopic dermatitis and also to identify the offending offending allergens and it is designed with practitioners in mind so it's a really really practical paper. So the way to reach a correct diagnosis is through your signalment, your history and your clinical signs. I'm going to skip over signalment and history but you can read them on the paper that I've just recommended and I'm going to briefly discuss clinical signs. Pruritus is one of the most important clinical signs. It's defined as an inflammatory and pruritic skin disease. The skin lesions themselves will vary according to the chronicity of the presentation and the distribution is variable. So typically all of the areas that are listed are affected. An important observation is that it is usually a ventral distribution. So if you are seeing lesions on the dorsal trunk, that would not be typical of canine atopic dermatitis. These are some primary skin lesions on a Jack Russell Terrier. You can see straight away from the discoloration of her hair that she is a chronic licker and you can see mild erythema affecting her interdigital spaces, her axillae and her ventral abdomen. She also has a few scattered papules on her ventral abdomen. This is a long haired dachshund with more chronic disease. This is his axilla and you can see the lichenification which is the skin thickening and the hyperpigmentation which is the darkening of the skin. So at this point You've looked at your segment, you've taken a history and you've performed a clinical exam and you want to make a diagnosis. In order to make the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, you need to make sure that you have ruled out other similar skin conditions and you can also apply something called Favreau's criteria to the case. Atopic dermatitis is a pruritic skin condition, so you must rule out other differentials for pruritus and this is always approached in the same way. The first of these are fleas and ectoparasites. You have to examine that animal with a fine tooth comb, do coat brushings, hair plucks and skin scrapes in order to rule out ectoparasites. And if you're still not happy, do a parasite treatment trial. I will actually do a trial in the vast majority of cases where I cannot find any evidence of ectoparasites as I want to be 100% sure that I have ruled them out. Here are some harvest mites. This is a Weimarner who lives on a farm and the harvest mites are sitting right at the base of the whiskers and they are barely, barely visible. And this is the same dog and this is this dog's interdigital space and right at the top of the picture you can see a few little pinprick harvest mites. If you didn't look for those you might well think that pet is atopic because the clinical signs were very, very similar. This is a young French bulldog with a pruritic patchy alopecia. And Demodex mites were found on hair plucks. And this is an elderly Shih Tzu, and she has a severe pruritic crusting skin disease, and Demodex mites were also found on hair plucks. After parasites, the second major differential for pruritus are infections, whether they are staph or malassezia. Pyoderma can present in many different ways, and it can sometimes look very scary. There is a Llewellyn setter on the left with pyoderma of his inguinal region and the French bulldog on the right has a generalized papulocrustius pyoderma. These are super easy to diagnose with a piece of sellotape, yet they are often missed or often disregarded. This is a pyoderma on the dorsum of a Newfoundland on the left, a dog de Bordeaux in the middle and an English bulldog on the right. Now remember what I said earlier, if the dorsal region is affected that would not be typical for canine atopic dermatitis so it's just an, an area to be mindful of if the pet has deeper lesions you may need to actually take a tissue sample for culture rather than actually sampling the surface of the skin so when you get to the point in your workup where you have excluded parasites you have identified and treated any skin infections and now you strongly suspect that this dog has a hypersensitivity it may be environmental, which is canine atopic dermatitis, or it may be food, which is called an adverse food reaction, or there could be involvement of both. 
it is critical that you identify the role of food in your allergic patient. All the signs may be due to food, which means that you could resolve the case through diet alone. If there's a dietary component, you need to identify this in order to ease the burden on the antipyritic medications that you are going to use to treat the atopic dermatitis. At this point in your workup, between 10 and 25% of dogs will have an adverse food reaction. If you don't identify those, you are condemning them to a lifetime of medication when all they potentially need to do is just not eat chicken. And the only way to diagnose an adverse food reaction is to perform an eight week elimination diet trial with a hydrolyzed diet or a home cooked novel diet. So we're gonna fast forward eight weeks. If your patient has fully or partially responded to the food trial, then you need to continue to focus on food. If they have not, you can now make your diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. And to help you, you can apply Favreau's criteria, which are a set of clinical criteria that have been developed from a large case series of conf confirmed cases of canine atopic dermatitis. Now, these should be used with caution, as if you rely on these solely for diagnosis, you will both under and over diagnose but they are a useful checklist. They are part of the jigsaw. So there is no magic bullet for the treatment of canine atopic dermatitis. There are three main abnormalities involved. There is an impaired skin barrier, there is the allergy itself, and there is also an overreactive skin immune system. And dogs may also have secondary skin and ear infections, and the treatment needs to address all of these components. Some recommended reading back to icada.org. There are comprehensive treatment guidelines available for the treatment of canine atopic dermatitis, and they have been and they have been published by ICADA. There are there was initially the comprehensive 2010 guidelines, and then there was the 2015 updated guidelines. These guidelines are available on icada.org. They cover a really comprehensive evidence-based set of treatment guidelines. They give guidelines for treating both acute flares and chronic canine atopic dermatitis and they are free to access and the next rewrite is due next year. So your next move is how to treat your patient. And at this point, it's critical that the owner understands that this is a lifelong condition that cannot be cured and only managed. The treatment is multimodal and it's individualized. Every pet will require slightly different and sometimes drastically different treatment. I approach the treatment from four perspectives as the treatment must be multimodal. The first thing I do is I pick an anchor treatment, which is going to do most of the work for me most of the time. Secondly, I have a plan in place to manage flare ups because they will occur. I also want to get this dog on some form of topical therapy. And lastly, I want to give them essential fatty acid supplementation. Your initial priority has to be to stop that dog from scratching, both from a welfare point of view for the dog itself and also to establish a good relationship with your client. So I want to talk about cost for a second and then I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Of course, many of the treatment options for atopic dermatitis are expensive, particularly for bigger dogs. But it is our job to give all the options to the owner, starting with the gold standard and working our way down. We sometimes fall into the trap of trying to recommend the most economical treatment for our clients rather than the most effective. Many studies have shown that this is not what the client wants. They want to receive all of our advice and our recommendations, and then they can make an informed decision that suits them and suits their pet. It's also important to note that pet owners are willing to pay a premium for ease of administration. So I previously mentioned that I pick an anchor treatment for my atopic patients. This is the treatment that is hopefully going to do most of the work for you in controlling the patient's atopic dermatitis. Whatever your treatment option, it has to be realistic for the owner. You cannot give them loads of things to do at home and expect that to be sustainable in the longer term. In most cases, you can select one anchor treatment that will do most of the work for you and control disease most of the time. You have four options of anchor treatment. You have allergen-specific immunotherapy, oclocytinib or apoquel, cyclosporin or lokivetmab or cytopoint. I can't emphasize enough that there is no place for steroids in this list. It is a very dangerous strategy to rely on the regular administration of systemic glu glucocorticoids to control a patient's atopic dermatitis. 
Now, I'm not saying I don't use them on atopic pets because I actually use them all the time. I use them systemically to treat flares and I use them topically both to treat flares and for long-term maintenance. They are very useful medications for pets with allergy, but their potential for side effects means that they must be used with caution. I'm going to talk about one of our anchor treatments for the rest of the presentation, which is allergen-specific immunotherapy. This is my treatment of choice for the long-term management of canine atopic dermatitis. It's a well-established treatment and has been around a long time. The treatment is dependent on you making the right diagnosis of atopic dermatitis and identifying relevant allergens for your patient through either intradermal testing or IgE serology. It is specifically recommended in the ICADA guidelines that I mentioned to you earlier, and its use in veterinary is not uh, and its use in veterinary is not limited to dogs. It's also used in cats and it's also used in horses. There isn't a huge amount in the literature about allergen-specific immunotherapy in veterinary medicine. And in particular, randomized, double-blinded, well-powered trials are lacking, but there are quite a number of open studies supporting its use. There are also quite a number of interesting review papers about allergen-specific immunotherapy that are worth looking up. Many of them parallel uh, immunotherapy in human and veterinary medicine, as canine atopic dermatitis is remarkably similar to human atopic dermatitis. So what is it? Allergen-specific immunotherapy was first successfully used in humans in 1911, which means that this has been around longer than penicillin, and it was first described in a dog in 1941. The World Health Organization definition is that it is the practice of administering gradually increasing quantities of an allergen extract to an allergic subject to ameliorate the symptoms associated with subsequent exposure to the causative allergen. Now, in a nutshell, you are presenting gradually increasing amounts of allergen to the immune system by subcutaneous injection or sublingual administration, rather than very small amounts by percutaneous absorption. This alters the way the immune, the immune system responds to the allergen. So you are trying to switch the immune system to being tolerant of these allergens. This is the only way to abolish ongoing allergic reactions. So it has a very important role in the long-term management of atopic pets. We now have multiple treatment options for pets with atopic dermatitis, but allergen-specific immunotherapy remains the only one that can modify or reverse the allergic reaction. This is going to alleviate clinical signs and help to prevent the progression of disease. This means that you can modify the disease without a lifetime of drug treatment with minimal adverse effects and with the potential of long-lasting effectiveness. The key is that when you identify an allergen through IgE serology or through positive intradermal testing, that you then establish if the allergens are relevant to your patient. Now bear with me here, you don't need to read all of this. So on the left, you can see the immunological changes that are reported in dogs with allergic disease. And on the right, you can see the immunological changes that are reported in dogs receiving allergen-specific immunotherapy. It is thought that the induction of regulatory T cells is the key to the process. Now, unfortunately, there are no bio biomarkers that can be used as a measure of the success of allergen-specific immunotherapy. You are using your clinical judgment to, to establish the success of the therapy. So if you are considering using allergen-specific immunotherapy on a patient, you have to go through several steps. So firstly, you have to have correctly ruled out other causes of pruritus and diagnosed atopic dermatitis, which we already covered. The next thing you are going to do is perform some allergy testing. And the ideal time to perform allergy testing is when the patient has been exposed to all the allergens that are likely to cause a problem and that they have a fully mature immune system. This means that they are at least 12 months of age to have been exposed to all of the seasons. You can test sooner than this, but you may have to retest if your results or your therapy don't fit with the clinical picture later in life. Now, very importantly, drug withdrawal times. It's important to be aware of these when performing allergy testing. There are a few papers on this, but I would always suggest that you contact your lab for their recommendations as each lab is slightly different. These are Avacta's recommendations for IgE serology and intradermal testing. 
I'll run through the withdrawals for IgE serology, as this is what the vast majority of us are doing. So for oral short-acting steroids, if they've been on less than one mg per kg daily for less than two months, there's no withdrawal. If they've been on a dose that's greater than one mg per kg or for greater than two months, you need to withdraw those one week for every month prescribed. For injectable short-acting steroids, seven days from their last injection. Uh, injectable long-acting steroids is 28 days from the last injection. Topical steroids um, on the eye or on the ear, seven days for Osernia, no withdrawal for the rest. And there's no withdrawal for topical steroids, Cytopoint, Apoquel, Cyclosporin, antihistamines are essential fatty acids. Now, just a word of caution regarding Apoquel. Some labs do recommend a withdrawal until the patient is symptomatic, so you need to double check that with your own lab. If you cannot get the patient off oral steroids, you can still submit your sample for serology, but you must let the lab know. They need to know the formulation, the dose, and the length of time that the pet has been on it. It is only theoretical that steroid affects IgE, so it is not proven. So then you have to decide which testing modality you are going to use. You can either use IgE serology or you can use intradermal testing. Although they are completely different tests, the success rate of allergen-specific immunotherapy seems to be the same regardless of which test you use. And critically, these are not diagnostic tests. You have already diagnosed atopic dermatitis. The purpose of the testing is to try to identify the offending allergens. These tests also enable you to differentiate atopic dermatitis from atopic-like dermatitis, as patients with atopic-like der atopic dermatitis will not demonstrate an IgE response. So if we compare intradermal and serology testing for a moment, most of us are doing serology because it's easy and it's convenient. Intradermal testing is directly testing the skin and detecting the presence of cutaneous mast cells with allergen-specific IgE on them. Serology testing detects the presence of allergen-specific IgE in serum. You need to be aware of the specificity, particularly of serum allergy testing. You will get false positives. So again, you cannot use this method to diagnose atopic dermatitis. That is a clinical diagnosis that you have already made before testing. I'll briefly mention retesting. You may consider retesting if the pet isn't responding to treatment as you expected or if their disease changes. So particularly, if they were initially tested at less than 12 months of age, if they move to a different location, or if the seasonal pattern of their disease changes, then you may consider retesting. While we're discussing serology, I will briefly mention serology for food allergies. Serology is not used to diagnose a food allergy. All it is, is an aid to selecting suitable foods for a dietary trial alongside the dietary history. The only way to diagnose a food allergy is to perform an elimination diet trial and a subsequent challenge. If you'd like to know more about this, then I'd recommend watching Tim Nuttall's webinar on diet trials, which is available through the Avacta website. So after you've performed your allergy testing, you have to interpret your results. And I'm going to assume that most of you are doing serum allergy testing. But regardless of what testing method you use, it is the interpretation of your results that is the single most important factor. The allergens you identify must be relevant to the pet's environment, and you will know that from your history that you have already taken. For example, if you have a pet with strongly seasonal symptoms that disappear in the winter and they come back positive to house dust mites, that is probably not relevant to that pet's allergy. You must always remember when looking at the results of your allergy testing that increased IgE levels do not necessarily mean that your patient has a clinical allergy to that allergen. You must determine if the allergen that they are sensitized to is relevant to them. The companies help us with this by devising regional panels. Now, of course, there are only so many allergens that they can test against because there are only so many that are commercially available. When you get positive results, you or the pet owner needs to research their area to find out if they are really relevant to your patient. And interestingly, we actually know very little about most allergens in veterinary medicine. The two exceptions are the Dermatophagoides house dust mites and Japanese cedar. So there are four key allergen groups. The first one is house dust mites and storage mites. The second group are grasses, trees and weeds. The third group are insects and the fourth group are moles and epithelia. 
So if we look at the first group a little closer, dust mites are a common allergy in pets. D. Teranismus is the pr predominant mite in Western Europe and D. Farinae is more frequent in North America and parts of continental Europe. Storage mites are relevant for dogs who are exposed to stored grains, cheeses or hay. Now, if you have performed allergy testing in the past, you have probably seen UK based dogs with positive results to D. Farinae, and this is because of allergen cross reactivity. This is where allergens are structurally similar and the immune system sees them as the same. There is very little known about this other than for Dermatophagoides and Japanese cedar. We know there is cross reactivity between Dermatophagoides house dust mites and also between Dermatophagoides and storage mites. So that may explain why you have positive storage mites in a dog that isn't exposed to stored grains, cheeses or hay. The next most important group are pollens. Your serum allergy testing will check IgE levels of grass, tree and weed allergens. These allergies are on the rise in pets, just as in humans. And you also have the problem of cross reactivity between pollen groups. So if your patient has a seasonal allergy, then pollens may be the culprit. It depends what sort of pollen. So whether it's grasses, trees, weeds, crops or flowering plants. All the different pollens peak at different times of year, with the entire season lasting from February through to October. This is a pollen calendar, and there are some really good pollen calendars available online that you can download and print out. As a general guide, tree pollen peaks in February to April, grasses from June to August, and flowering plants from July to October. Trees and grasses are mainly wind pollinated, so the pollen can carry on the wind for miles, going into urban areas and even in the windows of your house. Flowering plants are insect pollinated, so you have to see the plant in order to be exposed to its pollen. There is always a pollen forecast, so that's something that your pet owners can also keep an eye on. The third group is insects. So the only insect that is on the serology panel is the flea. And flea allergy dermatitis is one of the most common allergies in the dog and cat. The best form of treatment is aggressive flea control and successful immunotherapy for FAD has proved elusive. Now, of course, pets can have other insect hypersensitivities such as tick bite hypersensitivity or mosquito sensitivity in cats and hypersensitivities to insects like bees, wasps, ants and spiders. The last group are moles and epithelia. Now, these are less common in the UK and Ireland and depend on local environmental factors. They prefer high humidity and low ventilation. UK and Irish autumn conditions favour aspergillus in stables. But there is some evidence that mould proteases may degrade other allergens in allergen specific immunotherapy, most importantly pollen allergens, so they need to be in a separate bottle. There is also some suspicion that the extracts may be irritant. There is a lot of allergy testing going on for malassezia and staphylococci at the moment. It's not currently recommended as we don't know the clinical relevance of these. So regarding malassezia, there is plenty of evidence to show that a subset of atopic dogs develop a hypersensitivity to their own malassezia yeast. But the efficacy of using allergen specific immunotherapy for this on these dogs is unknown. So they are better managed with intensive anti malassezia treatment. Less is known about whether atopic dogs may develop a hypersensitivity to their own staphylococci, so the clinical relevance of testing is unknown and is not recommended at the moment. So you've performed your testing, you've received your results and you've interpreted them in light of your patient's history. The next step is ordering your immunotherapy and you have two options. You have subcutaneous or oral. Subcutaneous is the most documented method and it is very safe and effective. Artivetrin is the only licensed product in Europe. It's an alum precipitated vaccine, with, so the depot effect of the alum allows longer intervals between injections. In the US, aqueous solutions are mainly used, and there is no proven difference in safety and efficacy between alum precipitated and aqueous products. Oral immunotherapy is the other option. Now, there is very limited data published in veterinary medicine, but the consensus among dermatologists is that it is safe and effective. In humans, small amounts of allergen are administered and they're kept under the tongue for several minutes without swallowing. In pets, 
A small amount of allergen extract is applied between the lip and the gums daily and it's swallowed after oral administration. Pets shouldn't eat or drink for 10 minutes before or after administration. That is why oral immunotherapy is a better term in veterinary than sublingual. Intralymphatic immunotherapy is an exciting area of research where the immunotherapy is injected directly into a lymph node. It's been associated with a prolonged improvement in humans after three monthly injections. It's been evaluated in dogs in several studies and found to be safe and effective with a similar efficacy to subcutaneous and oral. However, most patients will need continuous injections. Short and medium term adverse effects are rare and longer term adverse effects are unknown. So when it comes to formulating your vaccine, you can either select, select single allergens or allergen mixes. And at the moment, single allergens are preferred. A single allergen is something like birch, and an example of a mix is birch, alder, and hazel. Up to eight allergens can go in a subcutaneous vial and up to 12 in an oral vial. An allergen mix only counts as one, so you're getting three for the price of one if you use an allergen mix. But these can cause a few problems. So you may get a false negative result if an insufficient amount of the allergen is present, or you may get a false positive result where the effect of multiple allergens may be irritant. A situation where they are useful is if you identify a very large number of allergens and you need multiple bottles of immunotherapy and the cost of this is prohibitive. Then you could use allergen mixes to reduce the total number of bottles required. So when you've received your vial, the next step is to start your treatment. So an induction protocol is required at the start of therapy and a maintenance protocol is required ongoing. The standard protocol is where the concentration of allergen administers is slowly increased to the full dose over a few months, which is then given at regular intervals. And a rush protocol is where the induction course is given across one to two days. This is the standard induction protocol on the data sheet, which you are probably the most familiar with. All of these injections should be done in your clinic and they can be done at home thereafter if the owner likes. If the owner is giving an injection at home, they must supervise their pets for 30 minutes after injecting. and They should give the injection early in the day when their vet is open in case they, in case they have any problems. Rush protocols then. In human medicine, they are actually associated with a relatively high incidence of systemic reactions. In veterinary, however, there is no increase in the frequency of side effects compared to the standard protocol. So it's a one day practice based protocol. Injections are given every 30 to 60 minutes subcutaneously. The patients are monitored constantly and an IV line is placed in case of a problem. There is no one standard protocol and there are various different ones described. It has mainly been described in dogs, but it was well tolerated in a very small cat study. The main advantage is convenience. It is much more convenient for the owner and it helps to avoid confusion regarding future dosing intervals. It won't work any more quickly than the standard dosing protocol. After induction, you move to the maintenance protocol. So which one do you use? There is little consensus on the right protocol between dermatologists. So essentially, it has to be tailored to your patient. Some dogs do better with a low dose given more frequently, and some dogs do better with a higher dose given less frequently. It isn't a single drug dose effect. The standard dose is one mil every four weeks, but this is not always the right dose. You are looking for the optimum dose at the optimum frequency that keeps the pet under control most of the time. So in order to achieve this, you monitor pruritus. If pruritus increases after the injection consistently, you need to decrease your dose. If pruritus recurs before the next injection, you need to decrease your interval. The frequency of injections may vary over the year. So with my own dog, he gets one mil every four weeks for six months of the year and he gets half a mil every two weeks during his pollen season. Protocols for oral immunotherapy are different. So for dogs less than 10 kilos, they get one pump for the first seven to 10 days, progressing to two pumps ongoing. And for dogs greater than 10 kilos, they get two pumps for seven to 10 days, progressing to three pumps ongoing. 
in order to adjust the dosing schedule, you just simply increase or decrease the number of pumps that you're giving. It is vital that you continue with your immunotherapy for at least one year. Now, a 2017 study of over 2,500 pets in the US showed some interesting results between general practice and dermatology referral practice. So in general practice, only 58% of pets who were tested went on to receive immunotherapy and almost 30% 30 of, 30 of these did not continue for the 12 months. In referral practice, almost 95% of pets who were tested went on to receive immunotherapy and just over 8% did not continue for 12 months. So it's really, really important that you explain to the owners that the point of testing is to try to identify relevant allergens for immunotherapy. You must also make it very clear that they need to continue for 12 months with treatment and that they are also financially prepared for this. It can be a hard sell because everyone wants instant gratification and quick fixes, but it's critical that you communicate this information. Many patients will need additional antipyretic medication during the first few months of treatment. Now, the exact treatment used will depend on the severity of clinical signs. So for milder cases, essential fatty acid supplementation, shampooing and antihistamines may be sufficient. For moderate cases, you might have to bring in hydrocortisone acepinate spray. And for severe cases, you may need to use systemic glucocorticoids, cyclosporin, apoquel or cytopoint. And the problem is that glucocorticoids or other immunosuppressive therapies may affect the mechanism of immunotherapy. So many dermatologists will avoid these medications or only use them in short term pulses, preferring to use something like Cytopoint, which isn't immunosuppressive. In terms of success rates, 75% of dogs should show at least a 50% improvement. So to be clear, you are not expecting immunotherapy to work by itself without any additional treatments. This would be relatively uncom uncommon. And the prognosis will also depend on whether the pet has chronic inflammatory changes in their skin, as these will worsen prognosis. Most animals will start to respond between three and six months, but it is vitally important that you continue until the 12 month period in order to identify the late responders. So in terms of adverse effects, firstly, immunotherapy is an extremely safe form of treatment. The most common adverse effect would be a transient increase in pruritus, which usually lasts for, for two to three days. If this happens consistently, the dose of immunotherapy should be reduced. Injection site reactions may occur, such as a localized swelling. These don't usually require any treatment. You may get more serious reactions, such as urticaria, angioedema, GI disturbances, behavioral changes, weakness, lethargy, or collapse. Of most concern is anaphylaxis, and the risk of this is about 1%. So for this reason, patients should be kept in the practice for 30 minutes after administering the first few injections, as if it is going to happen, it is most likely to happen at the early stages of treatment. And if your owners are giving the injections at home going forwards, advise them to do it on a weekday in the morning and observe their pet for 30 minutes afterwards. There are no monitoring requirements in terms of CBCs, uh, biochemistry or your analysis. In terms of contraindications, safety studies have not been performed on pregnant and lactating animals, so cannot be recommended. Obviously, atopic pets should not be bred from, so hopefully the situation wouldn't arise. It's also contraindicated contra in diseases that affect the immune system in patients with renal disease and if the patient is unwell or pyrexic. You should allow one to two weeks between your immunotherapy and vaccinations. Now, regular monitoring is absolutely key and you're trying to ensure both compliance and you're trying to monitor the efficacy of your treatment. And owners can generally administer immunotherapy at home so you must keep in regular contact with them to make sure that the treatment is going according to plan. And these patients will always have flares. They will always happen and they're unavoidable and owners need to know this. Common causes of flares would include the start of the summer season. Um, another time is when the central heating is turned on or if they get something silly like fleas or other ectoparasites. Now you should encourage owners to keep a diary or to keep some sort of record of their pet's pruritus. 
So is it a lifelong therapy? Yes, it probably is. The aim of treatment is to achieve the lowest dose and or frequency that keeps clinical signs under control. The aim of therapy is not to desensitize them over a certain number of years, and the majority of animals do require lifelong therapy. If they're well controlled, you can extend the interval between injections, either to wean them off injections or find the break point. And the 2015 ICADA guidelines do specifically address this. So when do I use immunotherapy? I would consider it in any atopic patient where I have identified relevant allergens. It's particularly beneficial when the allergen contact is unavoidable, as many of them are, or where other medications are not controlling symptoms, or maybe where symptoms are present for greater than three months of the year. I am happy to use it in patients with a shorter duration of symptoms also. It entirely depends on their presentation. So if you have a patient that you're considering adding in immunotherapy to their treatment, when should you do it? Ideally, as soon as possible. So chronic inflammatory changes will make the situation much worse. So you want to get in there before these occur. You have to make sure that you're incorporating it into a plan. So it's not going to work by itself. These dogs all need topical therapy. They need essential fatty acids and they may need other anti-inflammatory treatments also. And you have to remember with these pets, the goalposts are always changing. If their pruritus suddenly becomes worse, it's probably because they have a secondary bacterial or yeast infection or maybe ectoparasites. It's much less likely that their allergy has suddenly worsened. So you and the owner always have to be on the alert for flares. And don't forget about food allergies. If you don't do elimination diet trials, you will never diagnose one. So back to these four. Most of you probably guessed that the elderly retriever has no spleen. Um, the atopic dog, however, with the giant red arrow, he looks the same as the rest. And thank you very much for listening. And what we'll do is we'll I see that there's a few questions in, so I will do my best to answer them. So the first question is, the first question is, which is your favorite ectoparasiticide when facing a differential diagnosis of atopic dermatitis? So I would prefer to use an isoxazole. So you've got several available to you. You have Semparica, you have Brevecto, you have um, Crudelio, and you have Nexgard. So in terms of me giving the most comprehensive parasite protection to a pet, that's the one that I tend to use. Another question is, what is your first line drug to control pruritus in a hypothyroid atopic dog? So I suppose you've got multiple issues going on there. And I would wonder first is the how well controlled is the atopic dermatitis? Um, so I would look at the existing treatment plan with that and see what treatments are in place. Obviously, for the thyroid, you're going to start treatment for that. In terms of getting quick control of pruritus, I would actually typically use a small amount of glucocorticoid just in very, very short term. And I would probably prefer to use a topical treatment rather than a systemic. You have to use them with extreme care, but their efficacy in terms of uh, giving relief, a rapid relief from pruritus really, really is excellent. Um, let's see now. My box keeps jumping up and down, so I'm just trying to see these questions. Um, if a pet does not respond well to immunotherapy, can we conclude that he is not a topic or that we have not selected the right allergens? So no, unfortunately, with a success rate of 75%, some pets are just not going to respond to the immunotherapy. So you do need to, to you know, obviously double check your initial diagnosis, but trust your initial diagnosis as well. And owners need to be informed that there is a possibility that this treatment Treatment may not work and in that case obviously you have to use one of the other treatments that are available to you for atopic dermatitis. Um, question hi do some dogs need the vaccine for life yeah absolutely I'm not my, my aim with this treatment isn't to desensitize them over x number of years I want to give them I want to give them the lowest effective dose um, for you know at, at the optimum intervals and sure some dogs may after several years be able to be weaned off treatment but I would be expecting them and I would be preparing the owner for them to be on lifelong treatment. Uh, so the question after 12 months 
how long should we consider or how long should we continue the injections and if the allergy is seasonal it is enough then to focus the immunotherapy only in the problematic season so after the 12 months obviously you have to evaluate if your treatment has been successful or not if it has been successful, I would be initially just continuing at the same frequency as, as, as I have been doing. Um, and then if, if the patient continues to do well, I would consider just gradually increasing the, 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 fre the frequency of time between those injections. Um, somebody with a behavioral question, behavioral interested vest, you notice flare ups in cases where dogs are exposed to emotional stressors. 100%, absolutely. So we know for humans that I think it is 60% of skin diseases in humans have an emotional component to them. So, you know, stress or whatever it is will make the skin disease worse. And I certainly think that that is a massive problem in our pets. And I suppose part of the treatment is identifying those pets and trying to implement some you new know, some sort of program to try and help them with those emotional stressors as well but absolutely that will certainly cause flares um is there any risk of an anaphylactic reaction yes there is it's a low risk and if if it's going to happen it's probably going to happen earlier in treatment rather than later so that's why we would do the first few injections in the clinic and we would monitor the patients afterwards and that's why then if an owner is giving those injections at home that you make sure they do it when you are open so you don't want to be you don't want the out of hours vets to have to be dealing with this on top of everything else so they want to give the injection in the morning when they're at home monitor their pet for 30 minutes afterwards and um, and obviously then they can contact you if they have a problem so would I consider immunotherapy in an older dog, which has been treated with all sorts for a long time? Absolutely, I would. So age isn't a barrier to whether the immunotherapy is going to work or not. Obviously, the you know the immunotherapy has to be given the time to do that, and the owners have to, to know that. But certainly, I wouldn't let age be a barrier to that. I have a question, in which situation would you do rush immunotherapy? Is the severity of the symptoms a consideration to do it? No. So basically with the rush immunotherapy, the only advantage to it is convenience. So rather than having injection every two weeks and then every three weeks and the owner getting confused or missing appointments and everybody getting confused, you could pull the pet in and do all the injections on one day and then they would go home on monthly injections afterwards. So it's not going to, to, to you know to improve your success of your immunotherapy clinically. It's going if the pet is going to respond, they're going to respond within the same time frame, whether it's the standard induction protocol or the rush induction protocol, it's purely for convenience and certainly for me, I would generally use the rush protocol. I give the owners the option and the vast majority of them will pick that because then they know it's just monthly treatments then going forward. Um, a question, what is the correct age to go allergy testing in puppies? I would ideally wait until they have a mature immune system. So I would ideally want to be waiting until they're 12 months and they've been exposed to all the seasons. You can certainly allergy test sooner. There's no stopping you doing that. But um, you may find that you might have to repeat your testing if your clinical picture doesn't fit with your initial, with your initial results as the pet gets older. Sorry now. So another question, when should we expect to see improvement in clinical signs if the rush protocol is used? So the same improvement that we would see if we used the standard protocol. So you have to go for 12 months. I would be hoping to see an improvement within, you know, within the first three to six months. But you need to keep going for the 12 in order to allow the slower responders to have a chance. Our question, do you prefer topical or oral essential fatty acid supplementation? I prefer oral supplementation if I possibly can. And I would also prefer to use a diet that has has supplementation built in as part of the diet rather than a separate oral supplement. So my, my first preference is using a diet that it's built in. If I can't do that, so if the pet is on, you know, another 
another diet for other health reasons and I can't change it, then I will simply add in an oral supplementation to their you know, to their diet. I would only tend to use topical treatments where the pet has a medical condition that I can't you know, give them extra fat into their diet. So for example, if they're prone to something like pancreatitis, um, also if they're overweight, I'm not going to be wanting to give them extra fats by mouth. So if they're overweight, I would consider using a topical um, EFA supplementation instead. Um, another question then that has just disappeared on me a <laughs> second now. Um, there it is. So uh, regarding cost, which come, com, which one comes cheaper for the owner, immunotherapy or it says immunotherapy or treatment? So I suppose obviously it's going to depend where you work, what you charge. As a general rule, if a dog weighs probably more than 15 to 20 kilos, immunotherapy is always going to be a much more economical option for the owner because as you know, a lot of the anti-allergy medications, you know, your, your cyclosporin or Apoquel or Cytopoint do become very expensive for dogs that are, are greater than, than 20 kilos. So it's one of those lovely treatments that the, the immunotherapy is one of those lovely treatments that cost the same whether you have a, a Chihuahua or a Great Dane. Um, another question, is it okay to use, yeah. is it okay to use symptomatic treatment for pruritus during immunotherapy? Absolutely. And it's something you definitely should be doing. We don't want those patients being unbearably pruritic at home. You just have to be careful with which treatment that you use. So anything that is going, so glucocorticoids or any immunosuppressive treatment, so glucocorticoids or Apoquel or Cyclosporin, it's not proven, but they may have, you know, they, they may have an impact, impact on the success of your immunotherapy. So many dermatologists will prefer to either just avoid them during the first year of treatment or use them in shorter kind of pulses of treatment. With the glucocorticoids, you could use a topical treatment, so maybe your hydrocortisone aseponate spray, that would be much more preferable to using systemic glucocorticoids. But absolutely, um, you know, from a patient welfare point of view, we have to stop these pets from scratching. And also, you know, if the pet goes home and continues scratching, the owner is going to lose faith and we need to keep the owners on board for these patients because, you know, we can prescribe whatever we want, but the owners are the ones at home actually giving the treatments and doing the baths and doing everything else. So it's important that they have faith in us that, um, you know, that, that our treatment is working. So a question with rapid induction, uh, subcutaneous immunotherapy injecting every 30 to 60 minutes, how many injections do you give? So everybody does something different. There is no standard protocol. It would be great if there was. I personally use a protocol that was outlined at ESVD two years ago by Claude Favreau. And um, so when I get my patient in, I place my IV line and at uh, zero hours, I give them 0.2 of a mil, and I'm using the alum precipitated R2 veteran injection. So at zero hours, I give them 0.2 of a mil. An hour later, I give them 0.4. Another hour later, I give them 0.6. Another hour later, 0.8. And my final injection, another hour after that, is the full mil. And they go home then an hour after the last injection. That was a, a very simple protocol that he outlined. And uh, I've, I haven't had any problems using that. And I'm quite happy with that protocol. Okay. A question, what do you think about combining intradermal and serology test? Uh, in the ideal world, absolutely you would, because there can be, uh, you know, there can be slight differences in terms of the results that you get from both. Although the success rates with your immunotherapy kind of still hover at around the 70% mark, regardless of which testing modality that you use. So um, certainly in the ideal world, you would do both. However, for the vast majority of us, we are only doing one vast majority, myself included, um, are just doing serology. And I'm very happy with my results based on that.
So question then, efficacy with relatively low efficacy and the need for ongoing medication with either cyclosporin or Apoquil, how can we be sure that it is actually doing the job? Sure, so for the first couple of months, you probably have absolutely no idea if it's doing the job and you just have to, to keep the faith and, um, and continue with the length of treatment. And really the only way you will know is can you either stop your your extra antipyritic medications or can you potentially withdraw them altogether and i would probably you know if, if all is going well after maybe the first three or four months sure at that point i'd probably try and, and reduce the amount of my other medications if if that is not successful i put them back up to where they were and we'll continue for another couple of months and i'll try the same thing again so um certainly you don't know it's like when you're doing a food trial and you have to give your patient antipyritic medication for probably the first four to six weeks of a food trial so you have absolutely no idea if it's working or if it isn't but that is the the process that you have to go through and that's the length of time that you have to allow um, somebody's asked is it okay to use cytopoint while giving the immunotherapy absolutely so cytopoint um, is not immunosuppressive so that would be the, the ideal antipyritic treatment actually to use while you are giving the immunotherapy Someone's asked, do I use antihistamines in animals at all as they are widely used in humans? I do use them. Um, I don't use them with a huge amount of success, but I do I do use them. Um, I always think it's something that's worth a shot. Um, certainly kind of in the early stages of, of, of disease as well for people. And um, so I will, I will often try them. Uh, I have to say most of the time, they're not successful. I do have much more success with them uh, in cats uh, rather than in dogs. Um, question about raw feeding. Do you think raw feeding like nutriment is good for conditions? Uh, for me, the jury is out on that one. Um, I find with, I would have quite a few clients coming to me that are feeding raw and their skin is just as bad as it was when they weren't feeding raw. Um, I often think with with these dogs that, and we all see this that an, an odor just kind of gets lucky that they happen to to figure out that their pet has a food allergy and they've just done a very simple switch over. Um, so for me, I've never seen personally never seen a pet that has responded to raw that wouldn't have responded to you know the an appropriate hydrolyzed diet trial. So um, you know I. I'm quite open for my owners to feed their their pets whatever they would like to feed them. I'm not going to tell them what to feed them the same way as I'm not going to tell them what, what, what to feed their family. But I do tell them if they want me to be able to diagnose if their pet has um, a food allergy, then they do have to listen to me and they have to listen to me for the eight weeks that we do that. And thereafter, then they can continue to feed their pet whatever they would choose. Um, so someone has just said, is that is that three injections on a monthly basis or injections every three months? I'm not sure. Not sure about the gist of that question. Um, basically, with I mean, usually I would do the one day rush protocol, so they get all their injections on the first day, and then they will typically go home on the one mil per month regime. Um, thereafter and of course then if we can extend out the frequency between injections then we will my own dog's on immunotherapy and i wouldn't i'm a, he's he's thankfully responded very well and he would get his injection now about every six weeks sometimes it's a bit longer because i forget but it's usually about every six weeks A uh, question about gluten and grains contraindicated. So certainly for food allergies in pets, um, chicken or in in in, in dogs, uh, chicken, beef, wheat, and dairy are the most common ones. So certainly, I would be informing the owners of that. And when I'm using a diet trial, I do prefer to use the hydrolyzed chicken feather. Uh, based food when I'm doing my diet trials. Um, so certainly, it's a. Uh, it's, um, I think, an area that is very fashionable. Um, I worked in the UK for a few years and I'm back home in Ireland now and it seems to be equally fashionable that grain-free food is is everywhere. Um, but certainly from, from an allergy point of view, um, that would be account for a very small number of the ones that I would see. Perfect. 
perfect. Uh, someone's just asked about the antihistamines and caps. Do I have a preference for which one I use? I prefer the ones that only have to be given once a day. So owners have only have to do battle with their cats once a day. So typically, because you, you can try several different ones with cats. Um, and uh, this was... Um, I suppose I'm following the advice that I from a lecture that um, Danny Scott did at ESVD last year, and he would um, he he'd be a very famous dermatologist and particularly experienced with cats. So we start with with once a day. Um, I would typically start with uh, cetirizine for them, and you need to give it for two weeks to see if they are going to respond. And if they don't respond after the two weeks, then you can move on to a different antihistamine. But uh, once one a day ones preferably, and you can move on to the twice daily ones if uh, if they're not responding to that. There's a couple of questions about um, home cooked diets for diet trials. Honestly, I prefer to use uh, I prefer to use food out of a bag for a diet trial. Um, I suppose studies have shown that if, you know owners will, will start, of course they'll start off with the best of intentions week one week two, but to do that for eight consecutive weeks is quite demanding and quite time consuming. If they would like to go ahead with that, then you have to identify a, a novel protein and a novel carbohydrate and formulate your diet based on that. I think it would be a good idea to consult with a, a nutritionist as well when you're doing that, just to make sure that that's balanced. But I will encourage my owners um, where possible that if, you know, and it's just for it's just for the eight weeks, um, that we will use a commercially available diet to try and do the diet trials. So is the just the the dosage or uh, the the doses of R two for cats and dogs? Uh, yes, they are the same. So it's not a, 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 a I suppose it's not a dose dependent. Uh, I suppose a dose dependent process with the immunotherapy. So yes, we do use the same we we do use the same dosages in dogs as in cats. A question about a correlation between atopic dermatitis, adverse food reactions and other immune diseases. I think it'd be probably best to refer that to an immunologist. That's definitely outside my my area of, of comfort in terms of answering. And I don't want to give any wrong information about in terms of connections between that and other immune diseases. I'd probably put that to an immunologist. I think they'd be best best posed to uh, to answer that. Um, we said about combining uh, intradermal and serology. Ideally, yes, uh, you know, in, in, in the ideal world, but in practice, I don't think that is something that you have to do. Um, that was the question about antihistamines. It's just one mention about the intralymphatic um, immunotherapy. So that seems to be a really, really exciting area of treatment and will probably be a, a relevant treatment option in the coming years. Um, it's shown you know, a lot of promise and particularly it's shown long lasting effects after only about three injections in people. So definitely something, um, some, definitely something to do. Uh, someone's asked, well, using Apoquil in pulses during a diet trial affect the trial? No. Um, so when I'm doing a trial, I will typically have a patient on antipyretic medication for about the first six weeks. Um, so I, I'm not really too you know, too bothered during those six weeks as to whether my trial is working or it's not, because I don't know. Um, as long as I know that they're following the trial and they're following my instructions, and absolutely, it's really important that the pet does have um, you know, relief from pruritus during that time. So, absolutely, whichever antipyretic drug you choose, you can certainly, you know, you can certainly use it in pulses. You could use it continuously during the diet trial and maybe think about withdrawing it at about the six or seven week mark. Perfect. So I think that's everything. Um, so I will hand you back to, to Sammy Joe. And if you've any particular kind of um, technical questions about the immunotherapy or anything, um, the lovely people at Avacta would only be delighted to hear from you. So don't hesitate to get in touch with them. Thank you very much. On behalf of Webinar Club, I'd like to thank Catherine for a great webinar today. The recording and the certificate of attendance of this webinar will be available in the next few days and we will email you as soon as they are ready. Thank you all for attending. That's the end of the webinar.